coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. So there's this amazing like parallax, this this double think going on here that on the one hand, it's evil and wrong um, and stigmatizing and homophobic to identify this as in some way a gay disease. Um, on the other hand, this is the new AIDS and it is the great civil rights uh, crisis of our time. I mean, I've heard people on podcasts talking about making these comparisons, like people who have had monkeypox going on and saying we all need to rally around. And, um, you know, what, to me, what is kind of uh, astonishing about it by comparison to COVID? Well, a number of things are amazing about it, but it's it's astonishing to recall that during COVID, the CDC was actually issuing guidelines on what kind of orgasms you could and couldn't have. This is the good kind of sex that will, uh, you know, that you, you if you just stay home and you just, you know, uh, basically pleasure yourself or you have phone sex, like these things are acceptable and actual explicit lists. Um, and now you read the CDC and the WHO, it's like reading the diaries of a of a shy Victorian lady. Like, oh, I couldn't possibly get into detail about how that how this disease spreads. Hello and welcome once again to The Roundtable, your weekly editors and publishers podcast from The American Mind. I'm your host, Spencer Clavin, features editor of The American Mind. And I am joined today, as always, by managing editor Seth Barron. A number of our other uh, usual guests, or rather uh, panel members, are traveling out there saving the world. But we do have another guest, a special guest, which we're very excited to be joined by the University of Pennsylvania law professor, Amy Wax. Uh, Amy is a friend of Claremont, appears uh, semi-regularly in the Claremont Review of Books. We've had her on a few of our American Mind podcasts before, and it seemed like a really good opportunity. We got lucky with her schedule and our schedule to have her on and talk about the latest in a what I would describe having known Amy now for a bit as a series of uh, sort of manufactured controversies on the part of uh, U Pennsylvania and the law school. Um, Amy, it seems like every time I look on the internet, you're being canceled for some new reason. It's either your opinions about women or the people you choose to invite to as guest lecturers. Um, there have been a, a number of these conflagrations, and some of our listeners will probably be familiar with them. But the latest one, I mean, you can tell me if I'm right about this. To me, the latest one looks like the most dedicated and serious uh, attack upon you. Um, as I as I gather, it's an effort to strip you of of tenure, which is something that I, you know, I wasn't even really sure that, that such a thing could be done. Um, focused around this letter um, from Theodore Ruger, uh, he's the uh, dean of the of the law school. Writes a long, long letter um, accusing you of a number of infractions, uh, homophobia, racism, so on and so forth. This listing uh, out of context comments that you've made in in class and mentioning guests, uh, controversial guests that you've had. And and so you know th th we've we've published an article for listeners that want to learn more about this. It's by Alexander Riley. It's called "Brazen Falsehood." Uh, details some of the disingenuity of these accusations and uh, some of the logical inconsistencies in the letter. But I think it's it's important, probably also to note that even leaving aside, if you haven't read the letter, if you've never heard of this before, I mean it's it's quite obvious. I would I would imagine that the University of Pennsylvania hosts uh, extremists and uh, c controversialists on the subject of race all the time, just not uh, from this perspective, knowing the woke dogma that uh, takes place in our in our academic institutions. I don't doubt that there have been all sorts of uh, crazy, you know, t all sorts of crazy talk about white supremacy and, and the systemic racism of America. But um, Professor Amy Wax is the great threat to uh, safety and security for uh, presenting an, another viewpoint on the subject. Um, 
Two questions to start off with, I guess, for you, Amy. One is, am I am I right in thinking that this is sort of the most uh, dedicated attack that you've received uh, in your long history of having been attacked for various things? Um, and, and if so, why now, do you think? Well, I mean, first of all, it's it's one of a, an escalating series of charges over the past three years or so that have been filed. Most of them have never surfaced into the public consciousness. This one did because FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, got hold of it. This was a letter that my dean sent referring charges against me to the faculty senate, which is sort of the next procedural step under the internal faculty handbook guidelines for how to handle complaints against faculty members. So this is, you know, just one of an escalating series of charges. Uh, some were filed in 2021, then there were some filed on March 3rd of this year, and then there's this set, which includes some of the old ones, but adds some new ones. I mean, it's just this jumble, this this kind of incoherent mess of, you know, deracinated allegations, phrases, snippets, you know, things I supposedly said. Uh, it, it hints that I say them in class, but then in other places, it it says I said them somewhere else. I mean, there's just no coherence to it. Uh, it's It's a complete mess. And I'm supposed to, you know, figure this out and try to decipher it and figure out how to meet some of these allegations. As you said, they're acontextual. I mean, for example, the allegations that I said X or Y in class, uh, the date isn't provided, the class isn't told, uh, they don't tell me, you know, what the topic of discussion was, who heard it, was it corroborated? These are just stuff that they managed to get students to say about me. I mean, it's it's a total mess, but I think it shows their desperation because the original charges, well, at least the ones from the major charging document back in March, they were mostly about my political speech. I think they realized that that stuff was kind of shaky ground for taking tenure away from me. Uh, so they had to allege that I'd abused my classroom position. Uh, let me just say, and I don't want to, you know, bore everybody with the details, but the remarks that they attribute to me in the classroom, they're just fabrications. I mean, I, wow. I have not said the stuff that they said I said. I, I'll just give you one example. They allege, they accuse me of saying to a Black student, oh, you're an affirmative action, admit. You only got into your college and Penn Med because of affirmative action. Well, I never said that to any student. I don't even recognize this student's name. Why would I say that in class? What topic were we discussing? What was the occasion for it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And here's the kicker. I got a university-wide teaching award in 2015 that... Only a handful of law professors have ever gotten. They went through my record with a fine tooth comb. They interviewed multiple students and faculty about my teaching. These allegations, which, by the way, predate the uh, Lindback. I mean, they're years old. They're incredibly stale. Never came up. Mm. And all of a sudden in 2022, Someone's claiming I said X, Y, or Z, stuff about Mexican men or black men or whatever. They're not credible allegations, but it doesn't matter. They are out to get me. And here's the other thing, and this is, I think, a really important point. We now have in higher ed a situation where if a student says something, all right, if a woke student or a minority student, if, if people in these sacred categories say something, they can never be challenged, never be questioned. It's their truth, right? It has to be accepted at face value, however preposterous, you know, and implausible it is. And that is the new dispensation. And, you know, obviously I am <laughs> very much a victim of that uh, here. So here I am, you know, faced with what to do about this this torrent of mm. of allegations that that are headed my way uh 
They're all supposed to be the basis for sanctioning me. I mean, many of these remarks are picayune, uh, to use John Derbyshire's uh, word. Uh, many of them are just laughable. One of the causes of, to sanction me is that I said that when Jews intermarry, they dilute their brand, which, you know, would be funny if it weren't so uh, ridiculous. I, I mean, every Jewish grandmother in America said that when I was growing up. Every every conservative rabbi said it. I mean, are these people unfit to teach in a university? The whole thing is preposterous. So, so Amy, um, I mean, yours is not the only such case. I mean, very recently, uh, you know, even in the Ivy League, um, Joshua Katz at Princeton had his tenure revoked for you know, similarly kind of uh, refracted charges. Uh, which I think had been brought up before and then re-brought up. Is this, a, is this an intensification of the, the woke atmosphere that has dominated higher ed for you know, 20 or more years? And what are the implications for outside the, um, the, the, the halls of academe, in your opinion? If well, you have that kind of perspective. Just, Just pulling it. back from the from the ridiculous trivia of my case, I mean, in Josh Katz's case, you know, they purported to punish him for uh, an infraction of the rules on on uh, you know sexual sexual conduct within the university. That's what they said they were doing. He okay. had had an affair with an undergraduate. They had a good excuse they thought to sanction him, and of course. There's an ongoing argument about whether this was just a pretext for some very politically incorrect things that he said that made them want to get rid of him. So I'm not sure how significant his case is. I think that there has been a kind of acceleration and a building of uh, what I would call extraordinary boldness in in higher ed of universities and uh, institutions trying to gut tenure and purge the university of politically incorrect, non-woke views, and they've been getting more and more brazen about it. And I think my case is sort of represents a high watermark there. They're trying to do the following, okay? At least in my case, this is the thrust of it. They're trying to take speech and turn it into behavior that violates the mission and the values of the university. And that is the, that is the terminology and the vocabulary that they're using in my case. They say, well, we're all for free speech and, and academic expression, and we we're committed to protecting it. But no, when it becomes discriminatory and contrary to the university's mission, then we regard it as behavior. It becomes discriminatory behavior, and we can sanction that. And of course, what is the mission of the university? What are the values? The values are the diversity, inclusion, and equity project, as they define it, which means all groups are equal. Students can only be praised. There can be no criticism or any statements that might be hurtful or harmful or upsetting. Uh, or discomforting to students. I mean, think about the implications of those standards. And they just drive a Mack truck through academic free expression and the exchange of ideas. In effect, I guess if I had to summarize it, uh, I would say that the academy is trying to eviscerate tenure so that they can purge their institutions of anybody who expresses opinions outside this narrow Overton win window of woke positions. They want the university to be a place where only woke people can speak. Yeah, this is, you know, reading the letter, it did occur to me, you know, when, those, when the French postmodernists used to argue that, you know, tolerance can't extend to views that are intolerant, this was always kind of the end result. We're looking at exactly that point of view that there is, you know, we are the tolerant ones and therefore 
we don't tolerate anybody's views but our own because they're by definition intolerant, um, which is a nice little closed loop if you think about it. And I, I, I wanted to ask you maybe just to, to close, you know, <laughs> tenure is an, an astonishing thing for them to be going after because, as you say, once they got that is kind of the one remaining bulwark against the total wokeification of academia is that there are these guys that were grandfathered in and, and women that were grandfathered in, you know, and now have tenure and you're, you're supposed to be protected from exactly this kind of attack by that mechanism. So on the one hand, right, of course, it's, it, it's in some ways a, a more profound assault upon university culture than if they were going after you, you know, to if they were trying to fire you from your job elsewhere or trying to get you, you know, taken down off Fox News or whatever. This is um, in, in, in some ways more profound, but it also, as I understand, it kind of lives within the jurisdiction of the university and it gives them a certain amount of, of power to host these tribunals. Um, you're obviously, you know, you mentioned FIRE, which is where I found the, the letter published, which is a very helpful resource. I know they're fighting for you. It's the kind of thing that once upon a time the ACLU might have taken up, no, certainly no more. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, what are your recourses? How are you fighting back against this? What are your legal options? Um, and I know that you have, a, I believe, a fund that people can contribute to to help. So tell us about that as well, if you would. Well, yeah, I do have a fund. I just got notice from GoFundMe that they're reviewing my fund and they've frozen my fund. I did not yield the warnings that GoFundMe is sort of the creature of woke trolls and progressive trolls. They have complete control over uh, who gets the funds. So I'm in the process of setting up some new funds. So if people do want to contribute, they can email me and find out how to uh, how to help me here. Um, well, you know, what legal recourse do I have? Part of the problem here is that these universities are considered private. And even though they get a ton of federal money, all right, they can pretty much do what they want. And they do do what they want. Right. And the whole process of sanctioning me and, you know, calling me on the carpet is pretty much Penn being a judge in its own case. If you look at the procedures, they are totally rigged. Now, of course, you know, the First Amendment doesn't apply. Uh, if they want to dishonor academic freedom and ignore First Amendment principles, they can. Now, part of the problem is they have embraced voluntarily First Amendment principles. They've made a number of statements in which they say, oh, you know, we are going to protect these things. So legally, that's taken seriously as kind of a form of contractual obligation to me. How, you know, a court will interpret that is sort of an open question, in part because the universities have really refrained by and large from firing people or have not succeeded in firing people just for their political opinions. That started to change. That is starting to change. But there's not a big track record on that. But, you know, if I were to give you the bottom line, I would say it is an open question how much protection my tenure gives me. Uh, it is paradoxical that people aren't more worried about tenure being gutted uh, because it protects people on the left as well as on the right. I think a lot of people on the left think, well, we'd never say anything that would get us into trouble, so we don't really have to worry, right? Um, I think they're wrong about that. Or they think we've got ours and, you know, we'll just ride off into the sunset, especially older white guys. You know, they're unbelievably selfish. I'm, I'm sorry to say they don't seem to care about the generations that are coming after. And that's deeply disturbing uh, to me. That's one of the most disturbing things about this whole business is that there doesn't seem to be anybody out there who was really willing to put themselves on the line for academic freedom. So on the question of, you know, what legal protections do I have? Well, frankly, it's that's an open question. We'll be finding out. And I think that the standards that Penn applies to itself uh, are going to be a lot laxer potentially than what the courts will do if they see all of the deceit, the unfairness, you know, the stuff that's been hidden from me, the evidence that they've failed to turn over, uh, the way they've contradicted themselves. Uh, I mean, all of the awful things that they're doing, I won't 
go into the details because that's just too boring, but you take my word for it. Uh, they are not playing fair. They are not playing fair. And one of the reasons is they are a private institution and they don't have to play fair. Now, let me close by saying that I think there is this really regrettable passivity that the Republicans and the conservatives have towards what's happening in higher ed. What's happening in higher ed doesn't stay in the universities. That's a cliche. It's now being imported to the entire culture. The Republicans and conservatives need to get much more serious about doing something uh, on you know, just the complete takeover of the universities by the woke left, and that is a complete takeover. Here's something that they can do, and I'm just gonna put this proposal out there. I think we need a law that says that if universities accept pri uh, public funds, federal funds, they have to abide by First Amendment principles. Sort of analogous to Title VI, which says that if universities accept federal funds, they can't discriminate based on race. And of course, the Harvard affirmative action case is going to be a big test of how seriously that's going to be interpreted and applied. It's been applied pretty laxly in the past several decades. But we need a kind of Bill of Rights incorporation for private universities for free speech and the First Amendment. And I would like to see Congress act on this. This is something concrete that Congress can do to protect people like me and to provide something of a counterweight for the complete progressive ideological takeover uh, of the, the private university sector. Well, you're absolutely right that we've seen the consequences of that takeover. If anybody needed convincing, I can't imagine what else, you know, after the summer of 2020 and thereafter and everything that's been written about that time, I can't imagine what uh, what more evidence one would need. Um, although, as you say, there's still a lot of inertia. Um, if people you mentioned, people can email you to find out how they can help. I'm on your page now at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Your email address listed there is awax, A-W-A-X, at law.upenn.edu. Um, and well, uh, we hope, I hope folks will indeed follow up on that. Uh, we're going to bid you farewell as we move on to some other topics. But Amy, thanks so much for joining us. It was really uh, informative and we wish you well. Thank you for letting me uh, be on your uh, podcast. Of course. Excellent. Faithful listener, first time caller. Great. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Uh, that was really interesting. You know, I, I actually confess I, I didn't know. I was glad to hear her uh, talk about this because I had noticed only that the statements in that letter are so out of context. Um, but, she, uh, you know, to hear her come on and actually say straight up, like, I just did not say these things really adds another layer to it. And it's not totally shocking to me, given the nature of this this kind of inquisition, but uh, still really informative uh, and, and glad to talk to her. Uh, we're going to move on now to a few other items in the news, just Seth and I. Uh, and the first one is monkeypox. Uh, I think we briefly, hey, hey everybody, it's monkeypox hour. Um, yeah, I know. We feel like we should have a little sound effect or something for, for monkeypox time. But uh, the Oh, uh, where to begin? I think that we did actually touch on that. I think we were early noticers of the monkeypox phenomenon uh, back in an episode with Matt and some of the other guys. I uh, I said something like, you know, hmm, what could you not do? Um, th this phenomenon has been so funny to me uh, for a while because, OK, so we've got this disease uh, that's, you know, obviously spreading essentially through gay orgies. That is very visibly the primary mode of uh, transmission. It's people that have, you know, sex with a lot of anonymous partners. Um, and this is, you know, part of what we'll talk about today is how um, wildly the, the even the mention of this fact, right, in, in a completely morally neutral way has become kind of the new anathema. Um, you know, you're stigmatizing gay people if you don't think that you should have like, you know, anonymous sex in a dark room with in innumerable people. Um, and this is really actually kind of shocking to me, although I, I maybe shouldn't be shocked, but it is amazing that like 
<laughs> you it used to be that only the you know most dedicated actual homophobes would argue that being gay just inherently means that you want to have all this wild, debauched, degraded sex in dark rooms with anonymous people. And now you say, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you shouldn't have anonymous sex. And you get like, you're stigmatizing gay people, which doesn't really quite add up um, if if indeed it is the case that, you know, gay people do not like inherently always only have this kind of sex. But so I, I, I say all this by way of introduction to we are now getting like, here's Dr. Allison Arwadi on Twitter, blue check, you know, uh, talking about monkeypox. She says it's not a gay disease. There's nothing inherent in the biology of the virus that limits it to men who have sex with men. The virus spreads through tight knit social networks. It does not discriminate. Um, and I liked Guy Benson on uh, Fox, who is himself gay, tweets out just a screenshot of what was at the time the New York City health requirements for getting vaccinated against monkeypox, because there is this vax, which I guess is not for monkeypox specifically, but protects against it. Um, and and the requirements, you have to have meet all of these requirements. They, you have to be a gay, bisexual, or other man who has sex with men and or are transgender, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary. Uh, you have to be age 18 or older, and you have to have had multiple or anonymous sex partners in the last 14 days. So there's this amazing, like, parallax, this, this doublethink going on here, that on the one hand, it's evil and wrong um, and stigmatizing and homophobic to identify this as in some way a gay disease. Um, on the other hand, this is the new AIDS and it is the great civil rights uh, crisis of our time. I mean, I've heard people on podcasts talking about making these comparisons, like people who have had monkeypox going on and saying we all need to rally around. And, um, you know, what, to me, what is kind of uh, astonishing about it by comparison to COVID? Well, a number of things are amazing about it, but it's it's astonishing to recall that during COVID, the CDC was actually issuing guidelines on what kind of orgasms you could and couldn't have. This is the good kind of sex that will, uh, you know, that you, you if you just stay home and you just, you know, uh, basically pleasure yourself or you have phone sex, like these things are acceptable and actual explicit lists. Um, and now you read the CDC and the WHO. It's like reading the diaries of a of a shy Victorian lady like, oh, I couldn't possibly get into detail about how that how this disease spreads. Um, I don't know, Seth, uh, this this to me has become a kind of uh, like a, a, a postmodern uh, parable or or, uh, or or morality play. Uh, what do you make of it? You're in New York where you have to have multiple sex partners in order to get the, the vaccine. Is this stuff a, a big part of discourse over there? Um, you know, among among the like the Twitterati and, and uh, you know, people in charge. Sure. Absolutely. I, I mean, yeah, it really is like tragedy repeating as comedy, you know, with right. AIDS. I mean, AIDS obviously was like this horrible thing. It killed people like, you know, in droves. Um, and they didn't know what it was. And, you know, it spread through the blood supply and killed a lot of like hemophiliacs and uh, donor recipients, whatever, all, all sorts of people, uh, organ recipients, blood transfusion recipients, things like that. Monkeypox does not, I mean, it, it does not appear that, I mean, they've got control of the blood supply and blood donations. Uh, they know what it is. They know pretty clearly how it's transmitted um but they're trying to adopt the same rhetoric about it so it's funny because they're saying like i've read them them saying uh this is not an std no. even though its primary transmission is through through you know sex um right. and then they keep but i've also read them saying just as with aids it will spread into like other populations. Now, I was alive at the time when AIDS came around and they would say all the time, okay, it's going to break into the heterosexual community. And when it does, then people will start to really care. Right. Now, of course, it never did break into the heterosexual community um, in a real way. I mean, it broke, you know, unless you were like an intravenous drug user. Right. Um, but it remained largely uh within you know the 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 original community um but i thought it was funny because they're using this warning that never came true about aids now to talk about 
monkey pox. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think it regarding like the sexual practices of a percent of a, of a portion of uh, the gay community. Um, look, this is something that for 50 years or more has been kind of like, you know, a dirty secret. Um, you know, the gay rights movement kind of has been premised on this idea that all gay people really want to do, get married, join the army, and adopt children, or have children. And that's that's gay life in a nutshell. It's as chaste and monogamous as, as anything else, like you said, like some Victorian diarist. Um, right. Now, obviously, there's plenty of people for whom that is true, but there's also a very like, you know, vocal subset who, uh, you know, see it in a totally different way. You know, I don't want to say that they're all like Michel Foucault, but there is, you know, a sense uh, that 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 anonymous, random, like, you know, orgies are a human right, are politically liberatory, and that that's just what people want to do, and that there's that that gay life is is actually radically other than right. uh than like heteronormativity i mean when people right. say talk about heteronormativity they mean that well we just have a different view of how sex of what sex is and how it should be conducted and you know having sex with anyone you want all the time 15 people at a time you know that's as legitimate as anything else so there are these two different narratives that are in constant conflict. And I think that's why we're seeing this like parallax, as you put it, where they don't really know how to, they need to address it, but they don't want to. And it was the same thing in the seventies and eighties when they, when they tried to shut down bathhouses and some people really freaked out about it. I mean, yeah, this is like an original Claremont controversy that we published an essay in the first, I think it was the early version of the CRB. So like before, the current uh, uh, the, the current format there was a, a you know a, a, another shorter lived CRB and and we published an essay to that exact effect I say we I was not around but there there was an essay published to that exact effect millions of letters you know all of these how dare you suggest that it's bad to do you know to do bathhouses that this would in any way have anything to do with the uh, spread of AIDS or, you know, it's, you're stigmatizing gay people, blaming them for AIDS. And as you say, of course, AIDS, you know, at the time, uh, at least early on, was this uh, terrible, awful mystery. Nobody knew. And this is, of course, the original Dr. Fauci intervention into public life is like, oh, it's spread by contact. You might get it if you don't wear gloves in the home, like with children might get it. Um, and and right, it was this rampant. Literally, rampant. literally the same Dr. Fauci, not like that, yes, you yes, don't yes. even mean that metaphorically. Oh no, yeah, maybe people don't uh, don't grok that. No, I I actually mean Dr. Fauci, whose participation in this fiasco has been completely obliterated, tossed down the memory memory hole. But what you're saying, Seth, is exactly right. And I will say I have been saying this in like gay communities forever. Like, you know, what do you actually want? Like, do you want the Andrew Sullivan admission into you know, civilized life? And, you, you know, my feeling is you should. You we obviously want into that because it's a good thing. But if you agree that it's a good thing, like you got to clean up your act. You know, there's none of this like rejecting the heteronormative, like the heteronormative norms are the norms that we should all be aspiring to and, and organizing our life around with reference to. Um, and yeah, like there's there's this weird um, now basically both of those narratives are at a fever pitch, like they've both been dialed up to 11. Both gay people are, you know, chaste and perfect and it's, it's the Buttigieg's and their white picket fence. And like, I'm going to go to this disgusting orgy and like do and you can't you can't stop me. I mean, this here's the thing about this, right? He's like there are now in in the current climate, there are two diseases that are most mysterious, the two most mysterious um, diseases that can strike at any time for no reason and without warning are monkeypox and pregnancy. 
right? Like after the <laughs> Roe v. Wade thing, it was like people who find themselves pregnant, right? This as, as like it drops from the sky, you know, you wake up one day and it's something that pregnancy happens to you. It's not something you do. And likewise, like not even just to women. No, no, certainly not, because men can get pregnant too. trans men can get pregnant. Um, and and you know, in these these sort of two opposite ways, because pregnancy is this affliction now, right? The disease that you have to end with abortion when it just happens to you. Um, and monkeypox is this, you know, disease also that afflicts, uh, you know, the marginalized. And I do think that it is sort of, the, you know, this is an ideology that can't recognize the fact that, like, our bodies have natures and our desires have consequences in any way like it's not even like oh we'd like to maybe broaden the uh remit of what's possible what's acceptable what's moral um and acknowledge that there is some human diversity it's like no we're completely detaching you know sex and the body from all morality so if you if it's possible to do it like you, and if it doesn't hurt i mean this is the weakness of consent as like the one baseline for all moral questions about sex um and they they're going to keep talking about more and more diseases this way, I would imagine, because it's like, you know, you can't acknowledge that there are actual, but like orgies are actually worse than monogamous heterosexual or even monogamous homosexual sex. Like they can't even go that far. Like it's better to be faithful to somebody because like, and it's actually bad and unhealthy to, you know, just, you know, toss yourself into this pit of debauch. Um, I think those two things are totally related, like the 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 pregnancy stuff and the monkeypox stuff, both part of the same idea. Yeah, that's a great point. And it's not even a question of whether mass orgies and circuit parties are worse than monogamy. How about if you just make it like they are more likely vectors of disease transmission? Sure. Right. Right. You can't even say that. Again, you're stigmatizing. There's this whole front lash rhetoric going around that like, well, this is going to cause violence. You're by right. stigmatizing this, you're going to cause violence. So I just want to draw everyone's attention to this curious letter that the um, health commissioner in New York City, uh, Ashwin Vassam, put out uh, just yesterday. And he mailed it to, uh, you know, Dr. Tedros, the um, head of the WHO. Right. And he's demanding that the World Health Organization changed the name of monkeypox. <laughs> he says, we have a growing concern for the potentially devastating and stigmatizing effects that the messaging around the monkeypox virus can have on these already vulnerable communities. He continues, uh, New York City joins many public health experts and community leaders who have expressed their serious concern about continuing to exclusively use the term monkeypox giving the stigma it may engender and the painful and racist history within which terminology like this is rooted for communities of color. Um, so somehow the word monkeypox in itself is racist. Um, now, I guess what they're saying, I mean, you have to sort of read between the lines, is that if people call it monkeypox, they're going to think that black people are like monkeys. Now, right. that's this weird sort of thing where, like, they're pointing at you and saying, look at the look at the racist thought you put in my mind. <laughs> Why would any I mean, I guess maybe in the 19th century, people would make this association. But like, I mean, by this logic, why not change the name of monkeys? <laughs> how is that? How is this going to change anything? What is this going to do? And what they want to do is change it to like. I think that the the proposed the new proposed name is yeah. the HMPXV virus. Oh, good, that'll catch on. That's very uh, that's very catchy. But you know, there's something to this because if they can just change every name to like a string of consonants that are unpronounceable, yeah. Um, I mean, it's very Orwellian in the real sense because it's like, well, we'll just if we do that, then nobody can talk about. It. Absolutely. Nobody will even, it'll just be like, you know, so, something for a form, something that exists only in like spreadsheets. Well, I mean, I'm sure that if, if James were here, he would be talking about, I'm not sure, but I imagine if, if he were here, he would be talking about how like the only way to truly be pure 
from the taint, the sin, uh, the the moral stain of being alive in the world is to be completely disconnected is to become an entry into in a spreadsheet right like this is the kind of trend of of like the sanitization of the soul and and yeah it is uh, I, I like that term front lash i'd never heard that before but it, it's exactly that that's a, that's another steve sailor steve sailorism oh okay okay so yeah the idea is like we've got to get a you know there's oh my god terrorists just killed a hundred thousand Americans. We better get ahead of the um, all the racism that's going to happen. Right. Yeah, was, Richard Samuelson has a has a piece in the new CRB that's coming out, uh, in which he recalls the moment when I think it was in January of last year, maybe it was this year, but it, uh, there was a shooter, a Muslim shooter, who held up a synagogue in Texas. And the Anti-Defamation League issued a warning about uh, anti-Muslim Islamophobia. So it's like, you know, the rise of, of uh, anti-Jewish hate crimes <laughs> leads us to, to be afraid of um, that people are going to be racist against the people doing the hate crime. Um, no, I mean, it is like uh, it, 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 tragedy repeating itself as, as farce is a good way of putting it. And that is kind of like... AIDS was an actual moment when there was a, you know, a genuine crisis and we all had to kind of like pull together and figure out what to do about it. And I, like Douglas Murray talks about it's, it's not his term, but he talks about this idea, you know, St. George and retirement syndrome that once you've conquered some big uh, some big moral crusade, then everything has to kind of look like that because it's not a, it's not enough to just kind of put your sword away and and like be okay um and there's definitely an, an element of that that like you need the the terrible threat of stigma in order to persuade people into this crazy like spreadsheet world yeah i'm kind of waiting for them to say that um well in order to prevent the stigma we need to vac we have to vaccinate all three-year-olds against yeah. monkeypox and put them yeah. back in masks you know i mean why not Exactly. No, I mean, it's it. Why not? I mean, if it's convenient, I've, I'm assuming that in the blue states, they're going to like, you know, lock down again when it comes time to for the um, elections. But that's, I suppose, a, a segment for another day. Um, we did want to just watch. We can have uh, maybe ask uh, Jake and, and or Noah to play this clip for us of Kamala Harris um, introducing herself as the. Um, <laughs> what is it, Kamala Harris, she, her, well, I'll let, I'll let Harris say it for herself. I want to welcome these leaders for coming in to have this very important discussion um, about some of the most pressing issues of our time. Um, I am Kamala Harris, my pronouns are she and her, I am a woman sitting at the table wearing a blue suit. So, I mean, you sent me this, Seth. And she sounds you, you mentioned that she sounds like <laughs> like she's just all the joy has been sucked out of life. It's like there's just nothing left to live for except to go through these motions. I mean, is, is, is this now the, just going to be the standard M.O. of the Democratic Party? I, like, why no land acknowledgement? Where where's the, where's the like, you know, confession of that we that we stand on Cherokee land? Well, I guess this was some kind of disabilities conference and uh describing what you're wearing for the I, I guess it's for the benefit of of the, the the not even the blind or is it for the blind or is it for the people who can't see very well uh or i i'm not sure who needs to know what you're wearing and what color your hair is and yeah. what you're you're, although you notice the other people on the table all said what their ethnicity was. Right. Yes. Kamala Harris did not, which was interesting because, I mean, it was such a major factor in her elect in her. <laughs> well, that's why everybody already knows. Everybody already knows what race she is. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess. I guess I'm wondering, well, is this going to now become mandatory? like? In addition to pronoun statements and land acknowledgements, like in how long will we all have to also say 
what we're wearing and what color hair we we have and what part of the table we're sitting at um, in order to satisfy the needs of a hypothetically, you know, legally blind person who may or may not be there. But just to be done, I mean, look, given a, a hypothetical situation where such a person is there, if there's a need for that to happen, well, OK, I guess. But I, I you know, I just wonder, is this now going to be incorporated as the new thing? And how long and how long will we start seeing that? And how rapidly will it be adopted in all the official um, type of, uh, you know, corporate, academic, governmental uh, gatherings? Well, this particular song and dance routine where you say, right, I guess for notionally blind people that are, I suppose, not watching, but attending virtually, you say, you describe yourself um, and you, you're often it's like your hairstyle. And I'm a Caucasian lady with long black hair and I'm wearing orange or whatever. Um, this was also in evidence at a Microsoft conference recently. I remember this was another clip people were passing around. Um, and that one, I think, did include a land acknowledgement, from what I can recall. And it was this sort of corporate summit. So for one thing, it seems like, if anything, the government and the Democrats are taking their cues from the vanguard in business and in academia, which is kind of interesting in itself. Like, it, this is the, I mean, it, it is kind of an indicator of like where the intellectual, political, and emotional energy center of gravity is on the left. Like the people in charge are not the leaders, like which was always apparent with Biden. They were like, this guy is going to lead us to normalcy. But of course, the opposite is the case, right? The, the crazies are going to lead him to insanity, which they've subsequently done. And they, having absolutely no substance, will just kind of like adopt whatever is spooned onto their plate. So it does sort of feel like the causation is working in that direction. And I, the one thing I'll say is like your question about who is this for is actually really important, I think, because so, right, let's say that I guess we're supposed to imagine there might be a blind person who is listening to Kamala talk. Well, if you're blind, I mean, if you've been blind from birth, you have no concept of color. Like famously, it's impossible to describe what colors are. So people who are blind, like it, it, I'm wearing blue is a meaningless statement to that person. So it's obviously actually not for that person. It's obviously for the people who can see, right, who are like able to observe just how sensitive Kamala Harris is to all the different possibilities. Like, are you that sensitive citizen? And if you're not like then why exactly are you, why, why do you hate blind people? Well, uh, yeah, is it like, I guess it's for people who just sort of have cloudy vision. I can't yeah, even maybe. figure out what it's supposed to be. Like how many people are like that? I mean, I guess there's people who don't, don't see, like is it for people who forgot their glasses? Well, I, I guess there are colorblind people, although for them too. Yeah, people who forgot their glasses, like my like severely myopic people. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it is kind of, what they've got, though, right? I mean, they're re redefining words, basically, in lieu of doing anything. And I, like, uh, it, it seems like the economy is getting worse and worse. So they're redefining the word recession. Like, that's their solution to this. Well, the uh, war in Ukraine is dragging on. So we better, like, add another land acknowledgement or pronoun string to our announcements. Like, I don't know. I don't see them doing anything else. Do you? So, so what did they do? Uh, what, what, what's the new definition of recession? Oh, let me look it up. It's uh, they put it out on the White House website, and uh, Jake pulled it up for me in the in the show notes. I mean, what's the classic definition of recession? It's a recession. Let's start with that. Two quarters of economic contraction. Right. So this was on the White House, the wh.gov, whitehouse.gov blog. How do economists determine whether the economy is in a recession? It begins, what is a recession? While some maintain that two consecutive quarters of falling real GDP constitute a recession, that is neither the official definition nor the way economists evaluate the state of the business cycle. Instead, both official determinations of recessions and economists' assessment of economic activity are based on a holistic look at the data, including the labor market, consumer and business spending, industrial production, and incomes. And then it goes on. So, I mean... This is, as I as I said, this is sort of true, like it's not like that 
rule is is a hard and fast rule, but it sure looks like they're trying to. It's like when they say, well, you know, not everybody has X, Y chromosomes. There are some recessions that like have slightly different characteristics and they take that to therefore mean that like the category itself is completely exploded and there's no doubt. De- whereas in fact, they're talking about like a little tiny bit of fuzziness around the edges. So it looks like they're going to use the fact that this is like not always the way that people define a recession in order to just define what is about to happen out of existence. Like they're, they're just going to try to like, I, I have to imagine that whatever we, whatever occurs in the next year or so, like is not going to meet whatever definition of recession the White House decides to adopt until they can't deny it anymore. Right. That 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 that, that sounds pretty um pretty in line with what you would expect from from the way they um the way they operate. Yeah, I mean it's a it, it like I say it is sort of the one tactic that they in fact have. I mean the look like the world has a lot of actual problems. Leaving aside for a moment the stigmatization of like monkeys or whatever, or gay people who are getting monkeypox or leaving aside all of these invented, the, the possibility that somebody might not know what color Kamala Harris is wearing because they're blind. Like, uh, there are <laughs> serious issues facing us and not all of them, although many of them of the Democrats making, like there is in fact, a a, 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 a sort of rising tide of authoritarianism and 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 strongmanism around the world there is this like huge concern about what we're going to do with all this tech stuff as it becomes more and more advanced and these are things that could actually use a look from our politicians and since they are basically philosophically since the democrats are philosophically opposed to like naming the problem to uh dealing with the actual problems that that face us like this is they're sort of paralyzed at this point like they're they can't move left they can't move right they just have to sort of continue redefining reality until like we vote them out of office essentially i don't know it it it's it, it, to me it is just like all very predictable and all of a piece it's like just find new words to talk about things and that way you never have to fix anything i don't know well if your whole outlook is tra- Tra- like you know transformation is your goal right um i mean the easiest thing to transform is just the, the words your the definitions definitions and and, and diction right. um i mean it's hard to transform the world exactly right the this is like an actual it would actually require work um all right well that is all the time we have this week thanks seth for uh, holding down the fort with me. It was fun to talk to Amy earlier as well. And thank you all for listening to The Roundtable. If you want to learn more, visit our websites at AmericanMind.org, Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewBooks.com, and our D.C.-based Center for the American Way of Life at DC.Claremont.org. We're going to be publishing some transcripts from a conference that took place there at the uh, D.C. Center in a bit so look forward to those you can donate to support the show at claremont.org slash donate and another great way to help people find out about us and to support what we do is to rate review share and subscribe on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts thanks everyone talk to you next week 